Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the uh, opportunity to be speaking here at Nodes. I'm uh, really excited. Uh, there are so many interesting sessions today, and I'm very happy to be a part of it. Um, my name is Jonas Nolde. Uh, I'm from the sunny southwest of Germany. I earned my master's degree in computer science and media earlier this year. And now I got the chance to work at BerryBeat on intelligent data systems and automation. Um, in the session, I will present you some of my work. After a quick app demo, I'll talk about when you should fine tune and what you need. Um, and then I, I'll go a bit deeper into the data set and show you some of my code and uh, the fine tuning results. Uh, let me start by explaining our use case. Allowing our data, our customers to explore their Neo4j databases with natural language. Implementing good UI is challenging, especially uh, because our database combines many, many complex domains like welcome management or access management. We also want to be flexible and quickly adapt to changes in the database structure. Um, and lastly, we have different end user groups like receptionists or managers. And uh, we want to understand exactly what, what each group needs to know. Um, so LLMs allow us to manage all of that in one UI. And uh, now let me show you a demo. Um, this is our Graph Explorer UI. Uh, it runs in the browser and you could plug in any Neo4j database you want. Um, it lets our customers ask anything about their data, uh, however they want. For example, show me a graph of of very very big GmbH. And uh, we see the graph uh, of the company. Um, we can also see the generated cipher query. Um, even though I didn't give it uh, any hint, it correctly figured out that Verybit GmbH is a company name. It also optional matched uh, all relations that are there and gave them uh, individual names if they have the same type. Um, we like that answer, so we can give it a thumbs up. So we can see that BerryBeat has um, a trailer, a vehicle, and uh, four employees. And um, now we could ask a question about an employee, like Farhad Nozari. Um, like, for example, what events did you organize? And here we can see all the event nodes. Um, we can also toggle to the list view. Maybe that's the better visu visualization for that. And um, yeah, we give that a thumbs up too. Now we um, might wonder how many events did you organize? Because we don't want to count. Okay, so this doesn't look right. I expected a number here. Um, this is when our users could give a negative feedback. Um, number expected. And uh, we use that negative feedback to uh, figure out which questions uh, are answered wrong. We can then uh, fix this query and add it to our training data base. So after we fine tune our model again, um, this question will be answered. Okay, um, so the Graph Explorer I showed you um, probably reminds some of you of the Neo4j browser, but there's an important extra step that translates the natural language into a Cypher query. So the problem we solved is um, that based on the given Neo4j database and the user input, we need a Cypher query that satisfies the, that input. And our solution to this um, was to prompt an autoregressive auto decoder model to generate the query token by token. Um, okay, but how did we fine tune? 
um, why did we fine tune? Fine tuning a model takes a lot of work. Um, we did it because no open source model could solve our task otherwise. Uh, instead, we could could have used uh, an external API to open AI's models, for example. They are very powerful and could do text to cipher translation out of the box. Uh, and also, we don't have to um, have an infrastructure for hosting the model. In our case, the problem was um, that our customers' natural language input, inputs could contain sensible information. And uh, for data privacy and security reasons, we couldn't use external APIs. We have to host uh, an open source model ourselves to keep everything private. Um, another option to fine tuning would be um, to use retrieval augmented few shot prompting. Um, this works by including correct question query pairs into the prompt, uh, which are retrieved from a vector store based on the asked question. However, um, our database is very complex and it's very uh, difficult to teach all the missing information uh, through just a few examples. So uh, we figured out that our best option was fine tuning where we bake the missing knowledge into the model weights through training. Um, what are the, the ingredients you need for fine tuning? Well, you need a pre-trained base model. Um, the capabil capabilities should fit your task. So um, like, did it learn Cypher or um, does it understand German in our case? Um, also, the model should be of appropriate size. It should have enough par parameters for the complexity of the task, but it should also fit on your GPU for training. Um, my tip is to find out what model size you can fine tune on your GPU and then look for open source models on Hugging Face. Uh, we got our, 20, uh, our 13 billion um, code Llama instruct model from Hugging Face as well. And then you need a fine tuning data set. Um, you need high, high quantity and quality of samples. You um, could uh, anonymize sensitive data if needed, or you should if needed. Um, and specifically for fine tuning, only teach what the model doesn't know yet. Um, you should build on top of the base model's knowledge and not retrain it. You also need a GPU um, that can fit the model weights, gradients, uh, the data, and the optimizer. We bought our 25 gigabyte GPU for $2,000. And lastly, you need a training script that does everything from loading the model to training to saving the model at the end. Okay, now um, let's dive into the training data. It's the, the most important part for fine tuning. Um, our data set consists of hundreds of examples like this. And um, the input prompt in black um, is composed of three parts. First, the instruction where we tell the model that it should provide a cipher query for a new J database that answers the given user question. Um, next, we have the context, which in our case is the database schema. Like um, what nouns does it have, what relations, uh, and also the node properties. We also add annotations uh, that are useful to the LLM, like uh, that the modified on property of the event is an integer that um, contains a date time in epoch milliseconds. This is important. Uh, the context is important for the model, so it knows how to query correctly. Uh, and lastly, lastly, we have our uh, user input question. Um, and because we use supervised fine tuning, uh, supervised learning, we must provide the correct cipher query at the bottom. And here are um, two other examples um, for, uh, for questions the model had difficulties with. Um, list events next Thursday. Uh, what does next Thursday mean in cipher? Um, this is a very complex query, and um, our database also has events with uh, that could be multi days could spend multi uh, multiple days so uh, this makes the query even more complex um the second example show me all rooms is very easy for the model to solve but we want it to not only show the rooms but we want it to show a nice graph uh, with uh, the buildings and locations um, so we have a nice hierarchical layout for the graph So um, besides the choice of your base model, the training data set is the biggest lever to achieve good performance, but it also requires the most work. Um, here are some challenges we faced and uh, which you might also face. Um, 
first, which questions are rel uh, relevant to answer? Um, we solve this by storing all questions our users ask and uh, th so that we can analyze and validate them later. Um, second, uh, what kind of question uh, does the model have problems with? As shown before, we ask our users to give feedback with an up or down vote and downvoted answers will be looked at, corrected and then added to the training data. Um, and also if a, if a um, query ex uh, has ex execution errors, we also know that we have to correct it. Um, what is the correct query to the question? Um, in supervisor learning, you must provide a correct answer. Um, and we use upvoted questions, uh, up upvoted answers, um, so uh, to know which queries are uh, correct and add them to the training data. Um, and also we annotate wrong queries manually, um, but we have a labeling interface for that that makes it easy and fast. The last uh, challenge, which you always have when uh, building the training data sets, is uh, how to incre increase the qu uh, quantity and quality of the training samples. Um, we encourage our users to, to wish and be, be creative with their questions, so we get a lot of diversity. And also we um, remove duplicates from the training data because um, duplicates don't give new information in training. Okay, once you have a good data set, uh, you can fine tune your pre trained model. Um, let's dive into QLora fine tuning and how you can implement it in Python. QLora was introduced earlier this year um, and it combines multiple innovations like low rank adapters, where, where you freeze the pre trained model and only train um, adapter weights that are stuck into the model. The adapter is very small compared to the whole model. Um, it uses four bit quantization. Um, and uh, it uses a paged, paged optimizer that manages memory spikes. The code we used is adapted from the official QLora repository. Um, if you want to see the full code, you can look it up there. Um, but I'll show you the most important parts of it now. Um, in line four, we set up the model and also um, do the quantization. If you use the double quantization and the four bit normal float, you uh, get the best performance for the lowest memory footprint. And uh, here in line 17, we um, we set up the LoRa adapter um, where we define our target modules. These are the layers where the adapter weights are stuck on into. Uh, we can set the rank, uh, which is um, basically the size of the model uh, of the adapter weights and also the LoRa alpha scaling factor, which is uh, which which influences um, how much the adapter plays into the uh, the result. And in line 28, we set the paged Adam W optimizer. And uh, finally, we can tie everything together with the sequence to sequence trainer uh, and start the training. OK, so um, to finish, we can, I can show you some of our training uh, results. Uh, the different lines here stand for stand for different fine tuning runs with different hyperparameters. Um, each run took only about thirty minutes, um, and you can see how the cross entropy loss between the correct and predicted tokens decreased over the course of the training. Um, on the left, you can see the training loss for the training samples the model optimized for. So it is, it is expected to go down. On the right, you see the evaluation loss for unknown, unseen training, training samples. This gives you the best hint about which model is, uh, is the best. In our case, the blue line, the blue model at step 60 was the best performing model. And uh, you also saw the model in the demo earlier. Um, but once we get more data, more training data, we can uh, fine tune even better models. And uh, so in the future, these will improve. And um, with all that said, thank you so much for listening. I hope it was interesting and you learned something new. And um, I'm very happy to take your questions and answer them. Thank you. Hello, everyone. 
And welcome to my talk. Today, I will talk about LMs and how we can convert unstructured data to knowledge graphs. So let's get started. I will start with a little information about myself. Uh, I'm Noah. I'm a software engineer at neo 4 l And then I'm, I'm an LLM enthusiast. So I've been working with LLMs for a while now and doing different experiments with neo 4 l and LLMs. And here are some of my contact details if you want to have a chat or just send me a funny picture or something, just feel free to contact me on any platform. And yeah, the agenda for today, we will first take a look at the problem and possible solutions, what an LLM is and what a knowledge graph is. And then we will move on to how we tackled the problem in a previous project where we applied LLMs and knowledge graphs to, to yeah, convert unstructured data to a knowledge graph. And then I will show you a demo of our resulting pipeline or the result graph from our pipeline. So let's get started. The problem. The problem is that knowledge graphs are really hard, or sorry, the problem is that unstructured data is really hard to work with, right? Uh, and we limited us ourselves to text data for, for this project. And you can't really do much with text. You can compare it to other texts with some semantic similarity or similar but it's hard to actually work with the contents of the data, right? So our solution was to apply a pipeline where we have some unstructured text and do some information extraction and then end up with a structured format in case, in this case, a knowledge graph. So consider this image to the right here. We have uh, Alice is 25 years old and Bob is her friend. We uh, extract some information and we will get a graph looking something like this. We have Alice with the property of 25 years old, and she has a relationship to Bob saying they are friends. So cool, we want to use LLMs and graphs, uh, knowledge graphs to uh, gain some information from text, but what really are LLMs and knowledge graphs? LLMs are large language models. They are a kind of generative AI, which basically means that it's AI that generates some text in this case, since it's a language model, and they can be used in many different applications. Some examples are ChatGPT and BARD. You've probably seen some example of them. Like you can ask a question or ask for advice or anything with text really. And LLMs are really good at processing text, right? You can give it a full document and it will just take a few seconds for it to process it. And you can ask it to summarize it or you can ask it for key points, whatever you want. So it's really good at processing text, and that's something we want to exploit in this project. And they also seem to have some kind of common sense, right? You, you can say, uh, mention Alice, and it will understand that Alice is a name and just not a word it's never seen before. And that can be really good. Uh, for example, if a person has written a book, we know that that's an author, but it might not be obvious for all uh, computer programs that a person has written a book is an author but LLMs can figure that out. But there are also some cons with LLMs. For example, they have a maximum input size called the context window, which basically mean it can only consider a set amount of text uh, at once. Otherwise you have to do some fancy, fancy splitting up the text into different prompts, for example. And there's also a lack of transparency, right? LLMs, uh, we can give LLMs an input and we can say, we got this output from this input, but we can't really say why we got it. We just know that it produced that output. And, and then, yeah, just quickly, what is a knowledge graph? It's a graph that consists of nodes and relationships. Nodes are used to represent entities, concepts, and more. And relationships describe the context and how it's connected to other nodes. And here to the right, we have an example of a knowledge graph. Uh, so it's just basically, a graph way of representing information. So how did we tackle the problem? We created a pipeline consisting of three steps where the first step is chunking. The second step is extraction of nodes and relationships. And the third step is entity disambiguation. And I will walk through these steps one by one, why we apply them and how we apply them. And then I will show you the results. So first, Chunking. Chunking is the process of converting a document into several chunks. And in our case, since we have a text input, we want to split the text into pieces. 
And that might sound very simple, like we can just split the text after 200 characters. Uh, and we do this to fit the input space. So as I said before, LLMs have a maximum input size, so we can only give it like part of the document if, our, if, if, if we not have a really short document. So we want to split our long text into pieces, and you could do this by just splitting it after a few characters. So or a set amount of characters. But in this example, I will split after a few. So consider this text. Alice is 25 years old and Bob is her friend. Alice and Bob often play football. So if we just split after a set amount of characters, we could end up with something looking like this, where Alice is 25 years old, Bob is her friend, and then we have the second sentence, Alice and Bob. That ends, and the second chunk would be often play football, but that doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't mean anything, right? who often play football. So what we did to solve this was basically keep some of the text from the previous chunk in the next chunk. So we would instead get something like this, where we the first chunk stays the same, but all the next chunk keep some from the previous chunk, and the second chunk would keep Alice and Bob often play football. So in that case, it would make sense instead. And then we go to the really interesting part, extracting nodes and edges. And we do this by just prompting an LLM. And it's really cool that you can just give an LLM an instruction and it will perform it, right? So here's just an example I tried earlier where we gave, uh, I gave a little bit of text here. Alice is 25 years old and Bob is her friend and said, please create a knowledge graph on this. And you can see at the bottom, it created some kind of graph representation of, of the knowledge graph we've seen here before as I used a few examples. Uh, so it works and it's really, really cool. So what we did then was basically apply this pro uh, process to all the nodes we chunked up, or all the text pieces uh, we chunked up. So Alice is 25 years old and Bob is her friend would, for example, become uh, this, as we've seen before. And then if I have another chunk that is Bob lives in the city of Stockholm, which is 188 square kilometers, we would uh, get another Bob uh, node here, which lives in the city of Stockholm, which is a new node. And then if we just have some more uh, text here that says Stockholm is a city with a population of a million people, we get another Stockholm chunk. And now we have a problem. We have two Bobs and two Stockholms, but they refer to the same entity, right? So we really want the nodes to be the same. So that leads us to the third step, entity disambiguation which basically means we want to merge node, the nodes together to a single node if they refer to the same thing. And as I said, we have a set of nodes and relationships, some are duplicates, information can be spread out between different nodes. In this case, we want to merge them. And what we did to solve this was group up the nodes on the type. So for example, all the people node would be, uh, would be in one group and all the city nodes would be in another group. So, and in this example, we have two Bob nodes and we just ask an LLM, please uh, remove all duplicates. It does that, it uh, only gives us Alice and a Bob node. And for the second example with Stockholm, it would combine the nodes into one uh, bigger node. And then we can just connect the knowledge graph back together. Uh, so now we have a singular Bob node, so we just take all the relations connected to any Bob node and connect them to this one. And we have a finished knowledge graph. Real, I think this is really good. So, and it works. But this is, of course, a very, very small one. But uh, I'm going to show you now a demo where I run this pipeline on the James Bond Wikipedia page. Uh, and I, I'm going to show you the resulting, resulting graph, which looks something like this. So we have a large graph here. It's very connected. We have many different nodes, uh, as you can see at your right different types of nodes. So if we zoom in somewhere, we can, for example, zoom in here, we can see that I am Fleming is here. Uh, he is marked as an author, and I know he wrote a lot of the books the James Bond movies are uh, created from. And we can see here that he has, he has a relationship to some purple nodes here, which are books. And he, he published those books. I, I guess he wrote them, maybe he published them as well. Not sure. So that's something it kind of confused a little bit, maybe. Uh, and then if we move down here, we have James Bond, which is, of course, very important to have here. Uh, and he's marked as a character. 
And that seems to work. It has some connections to other characters, which he met in his different uh, movies. But it uh, made a mistake here, actually. So we can see that James Bond was banned in the Soviet Union, which kind of doesn't make sense for a character to ba be banned. It's probably like more the franchise that's banned. So it made a little bit of a mistake combining the character James Bond and the franchise James Bond into one node. But yeah, like we, we got the knowledge graph and it works, we have the information and then we can start looking at how the different characters are related, how they met, stuff like that. So I think that's really, really cool. And you can apply this to basically any document. Uh, so let's move back here to the slides. And I just want to mention some challenges and limitations. Uh, and first one, accuracy issues. It didn't work perfectly, but we only spent a couple of weeks on this. So I think like that we got the graph overall is very cool. So it would be cool to see if someone else starts working a bit on this and can create a better graph. That would be amazing. Then our data bias. We have to think about uh, who wrote the source document, which can read lead to a biased knowledge graph in the end. And then we have some leaps of faith here between different steps in our pipeline. We trust LLM a lot, the output for the LLM, LLM example, for example. And then model limitations. For example, the input length of the LLM leads us to need to do chunking, which might introduce errors into the process. Uh, and that's all I wanted to talk about today. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I've seen there's a few questions in chat, so I will start by answering them. But before that, uh, all this code for this pipeline is open source and available on Neo4j's GitHub. So if you want to take a look at it or work on it more yourself, feel free to search for NALLM on Neo4j's GitHub or just follow this link. And if you have any questions, please uh, send me an email. Uh, I'm happy to answer or help with anything. I hope this was inspiring and uh, somewhat uh, helpful. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll start with some questions. I have a couple of minutes here before the next uh, talk. Uh, I see someone here ask, why not split chunks at a full stop? Uh, you could do that, absolutely. But sometimes there's a previous sentence that's uh, also uh, relevant. So you we took a, like maybe 300 characters from the uh, previous chunk and keep it in the next chunk. So if you have several sentences, you can keep them. Uh, or it's a chance that you keep all of them. But you can, for example, maybe keep the two previous sentences or something like that if you want. Uh, I know chunking is a very hard topic, and many people have looked into it. So there's probably a lot of research you can read into if, you, uh, if you're very interested. Uh, someone asked how how did how does the disambiguation for entities that are named as Bob with a big or capital letter in the beginning, Bob or uh, without a capital letter, or Bob with several Bs? That's why we use LLMs for the disambiguation. Uh, so, for example, if we would have a Bob node that's uh, with like only his first name, and then maybe we have a Bob node with the first and last name. The LLM understands that these are the same uh, same entity, and will actually combine them together or remove the duplicates. Uh, and let's see, there's a lot of questions, and I have a hard time keeping track of everything. Uh, how do you ensure that your LLMs always provide the data in the correct format? For example, JSON. You can actually provide the instructions for the LLM on how you want it to output the data. It doesn't always listen, but there's some different frameworks. Uh, we know it's one called guardrails, for example, which helps you actually keep the correct uh, format on the, on the resulting data. Uh, and we're ending in five seconds. So I'm sorry I couldn't answer all, all the questions, but please send me an email if you have, uh, have more questions. Uh, thank you very much again for listening and uh, have a good note.
Okay, so uh, we are going to do a very quick overview today. It'll be fast and furious, um, <laughs> but uh, feel free to reach out to us afterward if you have questions um, or want to discuss this with us further. Um, we've got all code available, and of course, this video will be made available afterward as well. Uh, my name is Jennifer Reif, and um, I'm Mark Heckler, and we're happy to be here with you today. Yep. So I'm a developer advocate at Neo4j. Um, I like writing uh, code, and then I like uh, sharing that and, and kind of sharing my learning process or, or kind of what's behind it through technical writing. So I write a lot of blog posts. I speak at a lot of conferences or, or virtual events. Um, and then just outside of that, I'm just kind of a geek in general. Most things geek I kind of enjoy. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Mark Heckler. I'm a principal cloud advocate of Java and JVM languages with Microsoft. Also uh, picked up a few uh, awards and honors along the way, Java champion, Java Java One Rockstar, Groundbreaker Ambassador, Kotlin Developer Expert, uh, wrote a book, uh, which you see there, and I'm a licensed instrument rated pilot, which I don't think we talk about today, which is a real no. shame, but oh well, you know, it's, it's such is life. <laughs> <laughs> So a little bit on this session, uh, again, it's going to be a bit of a whirlwind, but we are going to kind of take, just dip our toes into the water of using Spring AI. And this is going to bring AI to Spring applications, uh, if the name doesn't <laughs> hint at that already. <laughs> um, they have both implementations for OpenAI as well as Azure OpenAI. Um, and it takes text-based prompts and turns it into language or code uh, for return results. We're going to use the technique called prompt stuffing. <clears throat> There's also one called fine tuning, but we're not going to go quite that deep and, and integrated yet. Um, so we're just going to kind of stick with the prompt stuffing. And we're going to do that through retrieval augmented generation or RAG. If you see that term quite a bit when you, when you see things about knowledge graphs or LLMs, um, what it's going to do is provide context and guidance for the LLM to return uh, more contextual and valid results and verify the results so that there's less chance of hallucination there. And I will say that we do a lot more things that we're not going to be able to cover today, which is kind of a shame, but uh, but that's why we want you to check out the repo and just to ping us after the fact, because there's a lot of things that go into various different aspects of working with, with AI in one form or another. Uh, and we don't cover them all, but we cover a lot of the high points. But within this very short session today, we cover the maybe a select few of those high points. So uh, if you want to talk about this at length, after the fact, please do uh, reach out. We're happy to, to discuss. Absolutely. <clears throat> so Neo4j is going to be used uh, as a, a vector database and to add that data context. So we added vector search capabilities uh, to Neo4j earlier in the year. Uh, I should say Neo4j did. <laughs> um, and it's going to help us ground the LLM answers by using the connected data stored in the graph. So you're going to have a prompt. It's going to be used uh, to feed a query, which is going to retrieve graph data. And that all is going to be fed to the AI. So the typical steps, um, you would calculate vectors or store embeddings in Neo4j. You would have the prompt um, that then would get calculated up and sent over to the AI with the data, the graph data. Um, and then, then it would compare the data that's in that prompt um, to vectors stored in the LLM, return the most similar. Um, if you want to know more about Neo4j vector search or the capabilities that are available there and how that works, um, feel free to check out the link. Uh, again, the slides will be made available, um, and you can click the link and learn more about how Neo4j is using uh, vectors uh, in their database. So without further ado, let's dive into <laughs> some code. Okay, so as Jennifer mentioned, this is kind of a whirlwind tour. Uh, so we we are trying to be very uh, judicious with the time. Ooh, that we've got the inception thing going. And once again, let me uh, switch. There we go. Uh, and and uh, we're going to try to hit the high points. Again, a very select few of the select few points that uh, we can cover. Uh, but uh, but the conversation is good. Our, our, I, our goal today is not to show you everything, but to get the conversation started so that uh, we can have a great conversation about this and, and develop things as we go. So I'm going to start off with the Spring Initializer. This is kind of where you start to build Spring applications. Not You don't have to, but this is a great jumping off point. So we'll use it. Uh, we love it. And we're going to use Maven and Java for our build system and our language, which are kind of middle of the road choices, good choices, uh, but you have options. Uh, using the current version of Spring Boot, which is 3.1.5, I'm going to change this to the hecklers because why not? I can. <laughs> uh, and we'll make the artifact name a Neo AI. Uh, we'll just make this a uh, an AI demo project, and then we'll choose just a couple of dependencies to bring in here. Uh, we're going to build a very basic, and, and we do take this a little further in the repo that we share, but we're going to build today 
a pretty streamlined version of that uh, that AI application, AI, AI enabled application. Uh, so we're going to build an an API here, a REST API, and we're going to uh, incorporate uh, Neo4j, of course, to to do that. And we'll make this uh, AI enabled as we go. So I'm going to generate this uh, this project, and we'll just drop that on the desktop. And we'll open that up. I'm going to just go out here to uh, kind of looking around things. Uh, but we should have that here now. So, yep, we have that. Let's go ahead and unzip that. And we'll change directories into there. And then I'm going to open that up in IntelliJ IDEA. Use whatever works best for you. Uh, I spend a lot of time in VS Code, as you might imagine, working at Microsoft. And VS Code is an awesome, awesome IDE. I also spend a lot of time in IntelliJ. And Jennifer and I have uh, worked together on in this in IntelliJ on this. So that's that's the path we'll take today. So I'm going to start first by going to the POM, which is the Maven build file. Uh, and I'm going to add a couple of dependencies that aren't already in there that aren't available via the Spring Initializer. So uh, let's see if I can, uh, yeah, the Spring AI dependency, kind of important if you're going to be doing a Spring AI application. And of course, we'll need to access our snapshots uh, repository, repo, so we can uh, bring that uh, all the goodies in, because this is an experimental feature at this point. It's not production ready. So we're getting a very early look, and we're sharing a very early look, which is kind of kind of cool. Uh, we don't necessarily need to put anything in the application properties. We have everything externalized, as most good developers should, right? Uh, and then let's, uh, let's go ahead and go to our application, main application class. This is, as it stands, the working Spring Boot application. It doesn't do anything yet, but it does work. Uh, so I guess that's a, a good start. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I am going to uh, just bring in a couple of, of existing uh, domain classes and repository classes and what have you, because I don't want to spend a lot of time focusing on the minutiae. What I want to do is save the time for the really good stuff. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and bring in a few things here. Let's go ahead and, and pop over to here. Let's drop those into there. And let's see what we get. And I'll walk you through these very quickly, but it's faster than, than just even addressing them at a very high level. So we, you, you typically, when you create an application, you start with a domain, right? I hope we start with the domain. OK, anyway, so we, uh, we defined our domain, and we have categories of different pet-friendly accommodations and um, uh, offerings within a particular geographical area. So we have categories, generally very broad categories. Within those categories, we break them into subcategories. And each category can contain multiple subcategories, right? Uh, and, and a subcategory can fall within various different categories. multiple different categories, yeah. And then within these subcategories, uh, you have places. So things like veterinarians and dog parks and restaurants and pubs and and hotels that accommodate pets and things like that. Uh, and, and of course, uh, Jennifer did a lot of the, the heavy lifting in terms of the data because she went out and, and combed through various different public APIs and sources to, to collect a lot of this data. And uh, I'll talk about this more as we go throughout, but uh, one of the, I guess, limitations with public facing AP or public, public facing AI uh, offerings are that typically they do a cutoff of two years back. So you don't always get the freshest of data. And, and in things where you want to be fresh, where you want to be current, like uh, is there a restaurant that allows me to bring Fluffy with me uh, to have lunch in, when I'm visiting New York City next week? Uh, restaurants can come and go very quickly. So we want to have as timely information as we can. And we actually, there are a couple of use cases uh, with AI. Many times folks train and use the AI solely on their data or they solely use public uh, data, we're actually blending the two. So that's kind of, a, I think, a, a fun application because we use what we know to be as current as possible to inform the data that we're pulling back from the AI. So uh, sorry for the little diversion there. Uh, so we have our category, subcategory, and places. And then we're going to be focusing on the, the place repository. Now, Jennifer was also kind enough to do some really nice uh, query building here using uh, Cypher. So uh, I, I defer to her Cypher wizardry here. Uh, and that gives us, again, some very basic building blocks for our, the purposes of our demo today, in which we can search for a particular category of, of, of pet or a particular place, a type of place in a particular location. And that gets the, the bulk of the uh, 
the setup out of the way. So uh, the one thing that we do want to do is, as I mentioned, we want to somehow use the documents that we retrieve, the information we retrieve to inform the AI search that we're going to be doing. So what I like to do is create a directory here under resources available to our application. I call this prompts. Clever, right? And then I want to create a file here that I'll call system.st. And, and typically, uh, you can have multiple different prompts to, that you can use to help craft the uh, the query that you're feeding to the AI. Uh, and again, we're streamlining this. We have one today, but, uh, but you certainly have uh, the option to build quite a few. And this is kind of what this looks like. We want to feed this to our AI queries saying, you are a helpful pet loving assistant that suggests and explains pet friendly travel locations to your users. And this is where I, I mentioned that we kind of blend things. Prioritize places listed in the document section below first, but include as much additional information as possible. So in other words, if we've been able to find via public APIs current restaurant information uh, for some you know, a small suburb in Cleveland, uh, that's great. But if we haven't, please supplement that. Or even areas where we have found uh, uh, different public references, maybe supplement that and fill out things that uh, perhaps an AI might be able to sift out that that we missed somehow, you know, via a hidden API or maybe something buried on a web page or something. So uh, this gives us a way to get started. Now, I'm going to focus again on a couple of things that are key to our mission here today. And I'm going to first create a vector store, uh, Neo vector store class, vector store, typing hard uh, store. And we'll make this um, we'll make this a class, right? And I'm just going to extend the vector store interface. And of course, in order to do that, I have to do a couple of things. One, I import that reference, and then I also need to uh, provide. Oh, actually, implement. <laughs> Got ahead of myself there. Uh, we need to provide an implementation of a few methods here. So uh, we're not going to be using some of these. Again, we're not going to be adding the documents. Thanks to Jennifer for pre-populating. But but we might do something. I'm just going to comment this. What we might do is something like a repo save all. And of course, to do that, we have to have access to the repository. Uh, so I'm going to just inject our place repository here and a constructor injection, which is the right way to do it in a Spring Boot app. And, and if we were to add documents, this is how we would do it. We don't have to delete any documents today, so I'm going to skip blithely over that. But we will be using something in terms of our similarity search. So uh, for our similarity search, I'm, I'm reaching everywhere for my mouse. We, we switched the mouse around uh, uh, for today. So if I do this, that's that's why. <laughs> so I'm going to, uh, the first thing you notice is we return a list of documents. And a document is is kind of the building block that we're going to be using to feed data to our AI search. So I'm going to uh, create a list of type documents here. Uh, we'll call this cleverly enough documents. And yes, thank you, uh, Copilot, for, uh, for suggesting exactly what I wanted. Very nice. So we're going to create a list of documents. And then I'm going to use our repo and I'm going to do a find in category and feed it our query. I'm going to take that and just grab the iterator from it. And then for each one, I'm just going to add that information from each place that we retrieve into a document. And then I'll just return the, return the documents. And that looks pretty good. Now, the one thing that I do want to do is, if you notice, these are overridden methods defined in vector store, but I do want to add the capability to take advantage of that other really nice query that we have built, or Jennifer has built, uh, and feed it uh, type and location so we can do something with that. And this is pretty easily done, really. We have another method built, thank you, Jennifer, uh, so that we can just do a find in places and pass type and location, and, and basically do the same operation. And we're going to use that later. Uh, I can do some minor changes here. Uh, I'm just going to, in this case, uh, create a, um, a couple of things here. I'm going to create a, a list of documents here of our documents uh, equals typing hard. And I'm going to call the similarity search uh, using the same query that we're passing in. And then I'm just going to return documents.sublist and take the sublist here, starting with zero, and return the minimum of either the requested size or the total document size. So if you request 10, but there are only three coming back, you'd only provide three, so we'll we'll clean that up. Uh, and that looks pretty good, except for some reason that's uh, 
barking at me. That's uh, that's so oh, rude. Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Ah, so so particular. And and I'm not really going to do anything with this. So I'm. I think I'm just going to. Uh, eh, oh, this is easy. Eh, why not? Just return uh, similarity search. And we'll just pass it a threshold of a zero, uh, double zero. So that's fine. Uh, we're not going to use that anyway. I just wanted to make sure that it didn't bark at me when I tried to use it later or tried to use the other things later. The next thing I want to do is just create, uh, we have our vector store. Now what I want to do is create our rag service. So rag service. And we're going to make this a service, right? So this will fire up uh, upon application initialization and we should be off to the races. I'm going to inject our, uh, not our, uh, place repository repo, right? And there we go. And the only thing that we really need to do at this point is, <laughs> thank you, uh, Copilot, is to create a, a retrieval method to retrieve a generation, an AI generation. And we're going to pass it our prompts. And of course, it's telling me there's a problem. Let's go ahead and import that and let's fix some of these problems. Uh, so we're going to pass in our prompts, which are, it, it's a map of, of string strings and objects, right? Uh, and I'm actually going to be uh, using hash map in this case. There we go. That looks pretty good uh, because we're going to have keys of type string and any kind of object uh, as our values. And that's uh, this is maybe a little lacking. Let's probably do a little bit more than that. So I'm going to uh, create a variable called vector store equals new uh, neo vector store and we'll pass it our repo so it can use that. And that looks pretty good. And now I'm going to, ah, it's, it's offering me some weird things here, but uh, we'll, we'll just do a type string here equals, and we'll see if it, uh, yeah, that, that looks pretty good, right? So if we pass in a type, we'll use that type. Otherwise we use hotel for our type. And then if we have a location string and look at that, we'll default to New York if we get no location. I like to make sure that we cover our bases in case something doesn't come through properly and that way our application just doesn't blow up. That seems to be a good thing, right? So we're going to put those prompts or put those documents that we retrieve from our vector store using a similarity search into our documents, right? Uh, and then we will create a system message, system message. And actually I need to do one thing before I can do my system message. Because if you remember, we created a prompt, right? Or a, a, yeah, actually our prompt, yes. And this looks pretty good. Thank you for that. So private, and it is a resource. Yes, yeah, so we need to bring this in as a resource, load this up, and we will take that, our system message, and we will use a system prompt template, right? And we will use our system ST. We'll create the message from that using our prompts. And for some reason, yeah. that's, uh, oh, yes, I should do that, right? Prompt. New system prompt. I get ahead of myself sometimes. That looks happier. That looks <laughs> much happier. At this point, we just need to uh, return. Eh, I didn't inject my uh, my AI client. I'm, I get so excited sometimes, I just can't help myself. So AI client, client, and then, of course, we want to inject that in our constructor. And that looks pretty good. So return. And we'll use our AI client. Client. Did you just call it client? I may have. You did. I did. Let's fix that. AI client. And that's happy. Oh, that, uh, yeah, that's, oh, then. that's fine. I could have gone the other way. Probably should have gone the other way. It would have been a little faster. This dot AI client equals AI client. Sometimes manually doing it just works, right? So we'll go ahead and create our AI prompt from this and we will generate this and I, it seems like it should work. Yeah. Don't you think? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Let's give it a shot. Okay. So I'm going to go back here and I'm just going to do a straightforward build using Maven W Spring Boot Run. Actually, not I build a run, right? And then hopefully that will work. Oh, uh, yes, I did. Actually, I brought over the uh, the controller class. Mm -hmm. So that saves a little bit of time. I don't have to, to code that. And again, we're keeping it simple here locally. And I'll show you a little bit more of the finished application. I I hesitate to call it polished. What did I do? What did I leave out? We'll take a quick look. Exception encountered, canceling refresh attempt, unsatisfied dependency. Oh, it couldn't create that controller. Oh, interesting. Did I not bring that over? I thought you did. Controller. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Okay. 
So let me, um, we won't need this. We won't need this, our very basic uh, API. We will need that. Uh, let's do a, uh, let's go back here. So Maven W clean package. Let's see what we get here. At worst case, we'll skip ahead uh, using uh, existing code that we know works. And we've checked into our repository. We've tested rigorously. We have backup plans. Yeah, we do. Always, always have a backup. Live coding. You know it's live when. Uh, so what did I miss? Failures. Error. Uh, I know I skipped several things just to try to uh, to get things tight and, and fast and streamlined. Hmm. Interesting. Found Neo, zero Neo4j repository interfaces. Oh, uh, well, that's, uh, let's see. So place repository extends Neo4j repository. Hmm. Looks good. And let's see. Wow, so that's interesting. All right, so I will do one more thing here before I just throw in the towel and pull over our existing code from our repo, which is fresh and guaranteed uh, guaranteed good shelf life. But I do want to, that's just so interesting. So did I, I say it's a package. let me see if I, if I didn't inject that properly. So we've got our repo and we've got our controller, which has the rag service and the rag service. Of course, we have that right there. It's just a mystery. So we'll probably find this later and be able to share with you what happened, but I don't want to uh, expend a lot of time on this at the moment. So what I'm gonna do is just, uh, just bring this over and clear this and we'll run this from here. And that works. It's certainly not my uh, ideal, but but it works. So we'll run this locally, uh, and then we'll go ahead and uh, run this in the cloud, and we'll take a look at this. So I'm going to go to the AI endpoint. We'll pass in a type of, uh, what do you want, uh, pub, and location equals New York. And of course, with Z shell, I need to go back and uh, put this in quotes, yeah. keep Z shell happy, and we'll see what we get back. And once that works, because it always works, live coding and, and live uh, demos always work. So we see that we're getting some uh, some results back. This is great. That's that's very nice. Let's go ahead and go to our cloud here. And this is where we've deployed it to Microsoft Azure. We're using Azure OpenAI as our, our AI backend and Spring, of course, in the front and Neo4j for our vector data store. It all ties together really, really nicely. Uh, you can go here to the URL and you can see that we have, and I can just close this, uh, you can see that we have our floof travel, right? This is uh, this is so you can take your floof with you when you travel, and this is very fun, right? So I'm going to uh, just search for restaurants, and, and we'll check St. Louis because that's close to us, and we may not have data for that, but it, again, the AI tries to supplement with what we have and what we don't have, and just bring in the full uh, the full Monty. So we have everything here that looks pretty good. Uh, let's go to vet uh, veterinarian. That's fine. Uh, New York. And uh, we'll search. So we get some, hopefully, veterinarians. Yeah, veterinarian places, Animal Medical Center. Uh, if we go to pub in Chicago. Yeah, so I mean, we have, oh, located the address list in the document section. Each time it comes back a little bit differently, but it's very nicely formatted always. Uh, it seems to always do a nice job. Restaurant, uh, let's do a restaurant in New York. Oh, I got New York on my, my mind here. Uh, so two great options for pet-friendly restaurants, the Greens and Seaport Food Lab, both of which are pop-up restaurants. Very nice. Sounds like it could be fun. So I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer at this point, and we'll go ahead and launch into Bloom and wrap up and then take questions and uh, see you in the uh, in the interwebs. Yeah. Okay. So let's switch here. And this one, right? And this one. Okay. So... Just a couple more minutes here, and I will go ahead and clear this. So uh, let's start off with just something uh, pretty 
pretty straightforward. So this is Bloom. This is Neo4j's visualization tool. Um, it has some pretty nice features, allows you to uh, search the graph, uh, the data in inside Neo4j uh, through natural language queries. Um, so if you don't want to write Cypher all the time, this is a, a good way to avoid that. Um, so you can see it pops up some nice uh, options for me to choose. And I'm just going to go ahead and choose place. And I can either choose specific relationships or go straight to some other entities. So that's what I'm going to do uh, for now. We're just going to retrieve some data. It's taking a minute. There it goes. And I need to fix my layout a little bit. So there's lots of different <laughs> layouts you can choose from. Um, and it'll take a minute to, there we go, load because there's lots of data here. So uh, you can kind of zoom in. Oh, dear. <laughs> there we go. Okay, it had to, it, the, the force directed layout had to kind of settle itself a little bit. So uh, you can kind of zoom in on this smaller portion of the graph so it's a little bit easier to read. And you can see we have um, places here in blue, we have subcategories in red, and then we have higher level categories in yellow here. So you can write queries uh, based on this and retrieve, retrieve different places uh, around the graph. So uh, next, let's just retrieve some places here. And I want to show kind of one neat thing. So this is a ton of places. And what I actually want to do is, uh, before I get a, too far ahead of myself, let's zoom in a little bit and uh, do something uh, based on the city that we're looking at. City, and we're going to type in New York, because that's, that's what we've kind of been searching for. So it's going to retrieve uh, 172 nodes here, just kind of showing up. And again, I mentioned there are a few different layouts here. So if we switch to a coordinate layout, you can kind of see it, it lays it out sort of like a map. And we can kind of zoom in on this just a bit more. And if we say, for instance, there's a, a limo service right here. This sits uh, down in Manhattan, kind of the lower part of Manhattan. Uh, if you were to look this up on, on Google Maps um, in New York, and then we could kind of zoom out here a little bit and look at maybe some other places. And if we pull, oh, where did it go? Oh, well, there's some over here. Um, but if you look, uh, this was the one I was looking for. Uh, this place right here is, click on it, and it falls over in Brooklyn, if you search this and, and pull it up. And you can kind of see, if you're familiar somewhat with the way New York City lays out, our limo services over here and then our Brooklyn Lismanade places over here. You can kind of see this blank area right there. Well, this is right where the river comes through between Manhattan and Brooklyn. So again, kind of neat. You can kind of see that map. Um, if you were to actually overlay this data onto a map, uh, it'd probably be pretty close. And it's, I just think it's kind of a really neat way to look at the data. All right. So uh, without further ado, let's do one more, cover one more thing. Um, and that is saved Cypher. So I've got kind of a Cypher query written in here. And that way, uh, business folks or those who don't want to try to remember a, a Cypher query every time can just type in a particular search phrase and find the data that they're looking for. So let's do that really quickly here. I'm going to look for a place and you can see the place query comes up and it's going to give me options to search for different types of places. Um, and I'm going to search for cafe and then I'm going to search in New York City. Let's see what we get. We get this lovely little graph here. So three categories, a subcategory and two places. Now, this is a pretty nice view. It's pretty easy to see because we don't have much data returned here. But one more layout that's kind of neat is this hierarchical layout. So you can see we have three categories that feed into the same subcategory and then two places that fall within that. So pretty neat uh, kind of different way to look at data, whether you're writing queries or kind of organizing the data inside the view or uh, kind of doing some other things. There's lots of neat visualization opportunities there. So, all right. Let's jump back to our slides and wrap up here, right? Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> so resources. Yeah. So please check out the repo at, uh, actually, I should have moved it out from under my personal repo, but we'll work on that. Uh, and we'll keep a link there. So uh, Neo AI, uh, if you want to know more about the uh, Spring AI project, again, this is experimental, but it's developing quite nicely. Uh, go out and check out the uh, docs here. That's a live link. And then, of course, the uh, website for neo for j Gen AI. Uh, is out there. Check us out. Contact us. Uh, email LinkedIn. Follow us on GitHub. Follow us on Twitter <laughs> slash X slash whatever it is anymore. Uh, and uh, we're happy to carry on the conversation uh, from here on out. Uh, just to, as a quick recap, what we wanted to do is focus on 
uh, the, the key thing, so we built the, the domain, right? The data was in place. Thank you, Jennifer, for, for doing the heavy lifting ahead of time on that, because that would take a significant amount of time. And then uh, we built the, uh, the domain and, uh, or brought in the domain and the repository. And then what I wanted to do is kind of focus in on, on showing the vector store and what it does and its use within the retrieval augmented generation. Uh, and then to go ahead and pull things out, present it, and then show it, and then show the visualization as you did in Bloom, and to give you a lot of different ways to examine and evaluate your data, or data that you have access to via some mechanism, public APIs, uh, Gen AI, et cetera. So with that, I think we're ready for maybe, well, we're ready to wrap up. But if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please do reach out to us. Happy to, uh, happy to, to chat. Thank you. Thanks.